Hey, it's Israel, the producer of the Argue and Peace podcast. I want to take a moment to thank you for listening to or watching our show. Your support and viewership means the world to us, and we appreciate you helping us reach more people. I'd also like to take a moment to apologize for the first nine minutes of this episode. We had some minor mic issues, so there is a bit of an echo for the first several minutes, but we hope that you still listen and enjoy. Although, feel free to skip forward to the nine-minute mark to just hear the quality audio. Other than that, we hope you enjoy episode one of Argue in Peace. When someone gives an opinion and someone says, I think they're fighting like this and this, I'm like, well, I know what's going on in your marriage right now. <laughs> and you really, and you probably enjoy actually like watching the last seven people who told me that ended up a divorce within the last year. Episode one, if we disagree, conflict. Conflict is part of human nature and has played a pivotal role in history and has shaped our lives through war, politics, and of course our relationships. In this week's episode, we're introducing conflict. Conflict is both defined as a serious disagreement or argument, as well as to be incompatible or at a variance, basically to clash. I would say that one seems to be resolvable and the other one is definitive. It's always the first sign of any disagreement or any relationship that anybody will ever have. If there's a serious disagreement, is that always an evidence that the relationship is incompatible? Is it possible that conflict could maybe be healthy? Is conflict the natural evolution of human interaction or is it a sign of decay? As it evolves, wouldn't conflict have to happen? Eventually, we run out of things to agree on and because of our individuality, conflict is required to maintain a relationship. I always say that conflict is a clay. I would say the conflict is the clay from which we salt come from. That it's the only way. Like the, 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 the path to peace is through conflict. And, and, and I don't see my role as being someone who amps up conflict. I see it as someone who amplifies the voice of one perspective in a war against the other perspective. And so that's how I view conflict. I think conflict is not only inevitable, but it's something we're just, we are guaranteed. Like, look, I, I don't know how many hours I spent learning algebra in school, but I can tell you the number of hours I spent learning algebra in school and the number of hours as a grown human being I have used algebra, the studying was way longer than the actual use of algebra. But I don't remember ever taking a class in conflict. And I will tell you, conflict was happening while I was in grade school. Conflict only got more and more part of my life. And I look at clients, whatever they do for a living, and conflict is part of it. It's part of their day-to-day life, it's part of their parenting, it's part of their co-parenting with their spouse. It is just like, it, it, you, you wake up in the morning and you should probably say to yourself, there's gonna be conflict today. I don't know that there, unless I'm on vacation, I don't know that there's a day that I wouldn't be in conflict. And even on vacation, there's gonna be some little conflict. You know, the waiter doesn't bring the, the, the tortilla chips, you know, whatever it might be. There's conflict. So why aren't we teaching people about conflict? Why don't we talk about conflict? And why don't we, when we're getting married, especially when we're about to form this bond with another independent human being, why don't we take the time while we're not in conflict and say, hey, we're going to disagree at some point. How are we going to do it? What's it going to look like? Like, what, what, you know, when you, you have, you have a unique opportunity in, in your role as a rabbi, you talk to people who are considering getting married. You talk to people and counsel people who are about to get married. I only talk to them on the way out the exit door. So, you know, do you take the time to say to people, I've always wondered this about you. Do you take the time because you've spent so much time working in a best den, counseling people going through divorces, dealing with issues of divorce. When you're dealing with people coming in the entrance rather than going out the exit, do you take a minute and say to them, hey, by the way, 7.3 billion people in the world, the two of you chose each other. You're about to like hold hands and walk through this really fraught path of life. You get to disagree sometimes. And what's that going to look like when it happens? Do you ever take the time to like educate people on conflict? It's like such a good question. No, I know, it's, I know, it's, I know it, sounds, it sounds like semi-pathetic that I'm involved in divorce and I know where yeah. a certain percentage of marriage leads. But I really think that a majority of anybody who's dedicated to any type of hierarchy of religion or God 
is working on conflict 24 seven, either some type of internal, even external conflict. Like it's part of the vocabulary. If you have a higher set of beliefs, you're not keeping to those beliefs. That's just life, right? right. That's why it's a higher set. Sure, sure. So it's an, it's an aspiration and you know you're not there. If somebody aspires to be exactly who they are or a little bit lower, that's usually what we call depression. And you have somebody who's having this internal conflict that I could be something greater than I am and I'm not. And when they get married, I mean, they shouldn't, I mean, just like it manifested in themselves that they felt like, hey, I'm an internal conflict. I'm not being who I want to be for sure. Their spouse is going to demand, you know, it's like Nietzsche said. Nietzsche said that when, when someone is attracted to you, you should be disenchanted from them because you should right away know that you, I don't know if these exact words are connive them or you manipulated them into thinking that you're better than you are because you know you're worse than you are. And if they're attracted to you, it should be like, what type of fool are they? I think those are exact words he writes. Oh, wow, how I deceive them. What type of fool are they? And it's the idea that Nietzsche understood, the way he understood life is that every single person has this part of evil inside of them called the monster that they're hiding and it's going to come out. That's their internal conflict. And it's going to manifest in their relationship tremendously. And I do believe that the majority of religions understand marriage as the manifestation of conflict, of the masculine deity and the feminine deity coming and like, how could they get along together? It's a total state of constant turmoil and constant conflict. Well, you bring up an interesting point because when you, when you look at, you know, and obviously we have marriage equality now, but, but looking just at male and female marriage, right? Heterosexual, traditional marriage. You, you have two creatures with differing bodies, right? Differing hormones, differing, you know, and again, you know, you don't have to be a Supreme Court judge to be able to say what, what, what is a man and what is a woman, perhaps, but. Oh, so we're but, already starting. Yeah, I have so already started. Episode one. Already, episode one. Throwing Molotov cocktails. Um, but the truth is, 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 look, I think we can agree that whatever gender a person is or however a person identifies, the reality is, is we're two different sentient beings. We're two different entities, right? And our experience is informed by different lives. We were raised, it, you know, we were not raised in the same Petri dish. We were raised in different homes. We had different experiences. So if you know at the beginning, we're going to have conflict. I mean, what you just said is it's conflict 24 seven, like that most of our lives are conflict with ourselves, conflict with our community, conflict with our, uh, you know, the demands of our employment and the demands of our family, conflict with our significant other. But you know, a lot of what you and I spend time in is, is conflict between husbands and wives, right? I mean, that's really where we both spend a lot of our time is in, in the clay or in the dirt of a conflict between a husband and a wife. And I'm just still baffled by why we're not taking the time to prepare people better for those conflicts. Because I, do you think there's such a thing as a conflict-free marriage? No. I, I mean, that would be a ridiculous reason to get married. <clears throat> you like, stay the same. Like, why? Yeah, I mean, I, I think there are certain people who, who, who wish that that was their marriage. Because like, I get the impression that you see conflict as growth. Yeah, I know. I, I see conflict as the pathway to growth. I don't see a possible way of growing without internal, so, external conflict. Say, so you so, said this to me before, so say more about that. Because I, so I, I think, tell you, like, conflict as growth, to me, I just don't think most people view it that way. And I think you fundamentally view it that way. And that always fascinated me about it. Like, you're just not afraid. You're the guy running into the burning building. Like you're just you, but you are. You're like the this the the like like marriage spiritual equivalent of a firefighter. Like everybody else is running out of this thing, and every and you're there going, all right, here we go. I'm going in, and you just run head first into that conflict. And I, I that is a very strange thing. Like that is a very strange thing for a person on the the spiritual religious path to make their home. So let me ask you a question: What do you enjoy conflict? Yeah, I love it. I get so, paid to do it. Yeah, no, without getting paid, you yeah, love it. Yeah, I right? love it. I do. I, I, it. I enjoy arguing with you. I see that you enjoy arguing. Why do you enjoy conflict? I think it's maybe different reasons than you, I, but I'm not sure. I, I see it as a chess match. I, I love the chess match of argument. I love looking. It's why I'm so crazed in our modern society, because in our modern society, it's the triumph of style over substance. And I'm, I'm, I'm often referred to pejoratively as a logic bully, because I, I look at people's logic. <clears throat> and so for me, as someone who's fascinated by argument as a science, argument as, as a strategic game, like chess, I, I'm constantly 
fit, what bolsters my argument? Where are the weaknesses of my argument? What bolsters the other side's argument? What, so it's an intellectual exercise for me. Fundamentally, listen, I, I'd love to do good in this world. I'd love to try to help people along the path to help them build a good post-divorce life. You know, I, I love doing what I do. But, but I enjoy it as an intellectual pursuit. I've told people for 20 years, I'm way more comfortable in a courtroom than in my living room. I have no idea what to do with myself in my living room. But in, in a courtroom, I know the rules of engagement. I know what I'm trying to accomplish, what the other side's trying to accomplish. And it's all about tactics. And so it's all about, we all know what the, it's like chess. We all know what the moves are. We all know what each piece is allowed to do. And it's just who can move them in the right sequence, in the right time, better. And so for me, it's an intellectual, it's like some people do Sudoku puzzles, I argue. So for me, it's an intellectual thing, but I, I don't get the impression, I, you do that very well. And you relate to me as someone who does that well. But I think that's one of the places we fundamentally differ. Why do you do it? See, I love that I asked you that question and you immediately asked me why yeah, I do it. Yeah, no, that. no, no, I think it's the same thing. I'm just trying to see how different like my answer is gonna be from yours, but I think it's very similar. I, um. I, I love, you probably know this, man. I love reading Nietzsche's work. And the reason why I love reading his work is I love arguing with Nietzsche. And I'll discuss in different, maybe different podcasts why I enjoy sure. arguing with him. Cause it's probably good you like arguing with him because he wasn't a big fan of the Jews. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's one of the reasons I like <coughs> arguing with him is how his, let's call it his students manifested to be some of the biggest haters of all, right. of all Jewish people. But one of, the, one of the things that is fascinating about Nietzsche, let's say in his book, The Good and the Evil, is when he tries to debunk philosophy. And if you think about it, he actually was so successful in fighting the philosophers that it could be that it was in his era, in his time, that the word philosophy changed the psychology, believe it or not. If you study that era well enough, the early 1900s or the late 1800s, like philosophy was the word, you made decisions based on philosophical perspectives. And then it changed. All Nietzsche's students became like some types of psychologists. I mean, even the tyrannical leaders that used Nietzsche's work all like played with the psychology game. So that 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 for me was was huge. Like to figure out how that happened. One of the things that Nietzsche liked talking about when he criticized philosophers was how do you know if they're being honest? Like how do you know if their philosophical perspective is just a memoir of their subconscious, which he liked quoting. Like, how do you know what they're, if they're genuine of what they're saying? Like, is this the real, do they really mean this? Are they pathological? Are they just lying? Are they saying, no, we believe that this is the way you end conflict, or we believe that this is the perspective that any religion should follow or any smart person? And Nietzsche criticizes them so strongly that he allows people to say like, hey, don't trust any philosopher. I mean, those are the words that he uses. So when I read that, I started figuring out, so like, what is the name of the game? Like, how do you know if a philosopher, how do you know if anybody is saying anything that's true? Like, maybe their argument, every argument in divorce is just their subconscious bias, which it probably is. And then you reach out to lawyers and you try to see, well, they shouldn't be biased because it's not their child or it's not their money. Maybe their arguments are actually legitimate because their arguments are being quoted in as case law and we're developing society based on their arguments. Are they genuine? Are they honest? And... I think the only way to figure that out is if you figure out if they're playing by, if they're always playing by the rules of the game. Mm. Do they ever stop? Like, do they have contradictions in their rules? And that's what's, what I find fascinating about arguing with you is I could predict, I know your rules. I know your pawn yeah. is never going to go right and left. Right. And I know your bishop is not going to play a horse game, which other attorneys right. like, you're like, hey, bishops don't go like that. Well, I found some legal loophole how it's allowed to go like that right. in some crazy random game in a different country. Right. You're like, well, that's not fear. And therefore, if you're really a believer of conflict like I am, and conflict brings and brings birth to the craziest, 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 newest interventions, and you find someone dishonest in their conflict and dishonest in their game, you get like very, very hurt. And you try to figure out like, do you understand how important conflict is or don't you understand how important conflict is? And that's why conflict and peace is so important because you could actually create new ideas and how to govern society based on conflict if it's done ethically and properly and in the pursuit of peace. You know, it's funny because when you're talking about it, you're, you're, you're using my chess metaphor, you're using the chess metaphor. And it, it, one of the things about you that I, I find fascinating is you're always playing the long game in everything. Like, I, I see you always playing the long game. You're, you're, 
you're an impatient, patient man. <laughs> you, but you are. Like you're impatient in the sense that you're very passionate and you're very excited to like, okay, let's do this right now. Like as soon as it was like, yeah, we should do a podcast sometime. The next like, day. All of a sudden there's like microphones set up and you're ready to, you know, and you, you, you like turn, you know, you have the will to turn the idea into the reality. Like the center was your idea, this, this nugget of an idea that suddenly was like a thing, you know? And, and that's how I first heard of you before I met you, is they're like, yes, there's this Rabbi Kahan, and he's just like doing his thing. He's got this best in set up. And I was like, when did that happen? Like, I drove past that, Bill. Like, I didn't know that that guy was there. And I was like, well, you know, how's he doing it without all the lawyers involved? And they're like, yeah, he seems like he doesn't need us. Like, he's just decided he's just going to do this thing and he doesn't need the lawyers. And all the lawyers were kind of like, what is this guy thinks he doesn't need the lawyers? And all of a sudden, you were, like, actually doing your thing. And, and bodies were coming in and out the door. And it was actually, like, working. And there were people that didn't need us because you were doing something different. And that's when I went, you know, everybody else kind of went like, well, I, I don't know what that is. And they just want to pretend it doesn't exist. And I looked at it and I was like, we got to figure out what that guy's doing. Because what he's doing, it clearly has value. It's clearly doing something. But I think you're, you're, when you talk about that, you're, you're talking about playing the short game and the long game. And, and so I think a lot of lawyers play the short game, meaning I'm going to use, I'm going to, I'm going to move my, my, my rook, you know, a way that I know it's not supposed to move because I can get away with it. But you're going to get away with it in the short game. You're not going to get away with it in the long game. And so this is not about like who wins this five minutes of the chess game. It's about who wins at the end, you know? And I think that's something you manage to keep your eyes focused on from the beginning of any conflict you run into. And, and, and you run into conflicts, from what I can see. And when you run into them, you run into them with the, okay, I know what outcome I want. The outcome I want is for these people to find peace. And so we're going to have to just get into the middle of this conflict to help these people find that path to peace. And that's, that's a long game. That's not a short game. It's made up of a lot of little short games. It's made up of a lot of little gambits and a lot of little tactical decisions, but it's a long game. And there's no longer game than the philosophy and spirituality that underlies it because you're talking about, again, ancient perspectives. Like when I'm talking to you, yes, I'm talking to a dude in his 30s who's married and has kids and who works in conflict just like me, you know? But I'm also talking to someone who's speaking with the perspective of, of people who lived thousands of years ago and, and who's deeply informed and infused. Your worldview is infused with that. And, th and that, to me, that tells me something about how ancient conflict is and how much longer it's going to be around. <laughs> how much longer it's going to be around. Yeah, conflict has to be ancient. And this is like the second time you've said that to me. Yeah, the conflict has to be ancient. Has what do you to mean by that? I don't think the world could evolve without conflict. I just don't see any science behind, behind any any growth through, through passiveness. But is there value? I mean, honestly, like like a, a a modern secular person who literally has in their pocket the sum total of wisdom of the ages in the form of Wikipedia, who has instant access to, I mean, I'm older than you, believe me, Star Trek, when they had the little things that they could talk into, it seemed like that would be magic someday, that the Captain Kirk could talk into a little thing in his hand and, and someone would hear him somewhere else. And now, kids don't have any idea what life, like, the, oh, you mean you didn't? There was a phone in the house that had a location in the house. You didn't just have your phone on you. Why don't you just text that person? Like, do you really think that, that, that ancient perspective has that much value now in modern society where, you know, some of the things you quote to me on a regular basis were, 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 were written by people who didn't understand germ theory, who didn't understand ultraviolet radiation, who didn't understand, and, and you really still think that's the fundamental thing we should be building on? That's such a good question, and the answer in the short is yeah. But I, I would I, hope I, the answer yeah. is yeah, for you. But, but I'll tell you why, I'll tell you why, and let's say- that, That's what know, I'm interested pick, in hearing. Pick, pick, any, pick any name, Jewish or non-Jewish, but somebody that at, at least 500 years ago, 
All right, so you're putting me on the spot. So, so pick uh, any character. It doesn't have character to be a fictional, from, non-fictional. All right, anybody. character from history. All right, uh, Captain Hook from Peter Pan. Captain Hook from Peter Pan. I went random on you. Yeah, I wasn't that's... gonna get, make it easy. I couldn't just say Moses for you. I so, gotta have so, so Captain Hook from Peter Pan is actually a very, very easy example, and I, 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 I think I'll be able to work with it. Think about this. Captain Hook is this individual personally that you could get to know. You could sit down and have, you probably could have a therapy session. Like, why are you so afraid of clocks? And why are you afraid of a crocodile? And what do you have that you're chasing the kid Peter? And like, why are you running after him? Are you and, really mourning your and arm? And like, what what, yeah, what's yeah. going on? Like, like, why does the crocodile still have your arm? How come he didn't eat it? Is it a figment right. of your imagination? Who are you? Are you tyrannical? Are you not? You could really get to know him and judge who he is. And you could have such a conversation that in your mind, he's not Captain Hook. Like, he's Fievel Hook. Whatever his first name right, is, you're referring right. to. I don't like, think everybody remember like Steve Hook. Steve Hook, like yeah. he's Steve, and don't yeah. refer to him as Hook. Yeah. Like you don't know yeah. him the way I do. Yeah. But the spirit of Captain Hook, you need to preserve in order to be able to have that movie or that idea. And if you're gonna go sit with a therapy session with Captain Hook, and you're gonna see him differently than the tyrannical figure, you're gonna debunk the whole entire history of that myth of whatever Captain Hook was trying to present, right? Okay. So Captain Hook is this idea, this spirit of a tyrannical individual that we need to figure out, or we're not going to figure out why he's being tyrannical. And there are many individuals in your life that are going to be Captain Hooks, right? So there are two figures. There's what we call the general spirit of Captain Hook. And then Captain Hook manifests the spirit of Captain Hook. Like, you're not acting like the Captain Hook I expected you to act. Like, you could, you could, you could confuse me. Like, you came in as Captain Hook, but you're not fulfilling the spirit of Captain Hook. Got it. Right? And Judaism, I think not only looks at figures as what they actually did, they look at them as spirit of ideas. Mm -hmm. Like, take the argument that the Kabbalist, the mystics like saying that the, the biblical text was created before humans were created. They have that terminology. that the Moses was, The story of Moses was written before Moses was around. And Moses ended up playing the perfect role of Moses, so he ended up being Moses. This is, you know, this is big stuff. Yeah, I, like, I mean, you're like, blowing like my podcast. mind on a, yeah, no, no, I, I love it. I, I, I think, I mean, because if I hear it as like there's, see, I, and, and of course, you say, you know, again, this is, this is the core of you and I. So you, you throw out some really esoteric, ancient, philosophical thing, and I find myself immediately applying it to something day to day in the work I do. And, and this is why I love talking to you, because I walk out of, I walk out of every conversation with something like that. So I think you're absolutely right. I mean, there's, because a lot of what I do, when, I, when you say this to me, a lot of what I do is a judge is sitting up on a bench far away and they're higher up in the room, right? To symbolize something about them being a higher wisdom or a higher perspective. And I'm trying to think of, I always tell people what I do for a living is full contact storytelling. And so the story we're trying to tell, I'm trying to tell the story of Steve Hook. I'm trying to tell the court who Steve Hook is. You got cat. You got this. She keeps talking about this Captain Hook, but you got him all wrong. This is Steve. Steve is dis he's, he's disabled. You know, he had a tragedy. He had a trauma. He lost his arm to a crocodile. You know, he's still dealing with the, the grief of that. And I'm trying to tell that story. And I know the story the other side's trying to tell. They're trying to tell the story of Captain Hook. And they're convinced that there is no Steve Hook, that Steve Hook is a fiction and Captain Hook's the real person. And I'm trying to get in there and say, no, 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 Steve Hook is Steve Hook. I want to put him on the witness stand. I want you to hear his voice. I want you to get to know him. I want you to like him. I want to acknowledge that he's got some faults. You know, he's got the thing with the clocks. Nobody understands. But he's, the <laughs> truth is, if you get to know Steve Hook, then, you know, I've done my job, right? And if all you walk out of that room with is, oh, that guy's Captain Hook. I don't care who you think he is. So I, I get that. It's like the Picasso. You ever paid attention to Picasso's painting? He has always the face looking this way and the face looking that way. Yeah. You see two, through two different perspectives. You can see the Captain Hook and the Steve Hook. Yeah. And it's the idea, I think, what old texts do to people. You have the Moses, right? And you have people acting like Moses. Or you have the Abraham and you have the Isaacs and you have right. the Jacobs or wherever you have the, the, the Queen Esthers and you have right. Rachel and you have Rebecca. And then you're like, well, this is what Rebecca was supposed to play out. This is the spirit of Rebecca. And then there's actual Rebecca. Like, did she make a mistake? What did she accomplish? Like the mystics have this beautiful word that they believe that every single human has what they call the, the, the bottom and the top of their personality, which is referring to like, how they're supposed to be and how they are. 
So is that where conflict is born? Is that where conflict comes from? That it comes from the expectation that I'm... To fulfill a spirit. Well, yeah, and to fulfill... I mean, it's, it's, it's where the reality of the person versus the idea of the person or the Socratic ideal of the person conflicts with the story I have been telling myself about that person. Like, I don't know how many times yeah, you yeah. hear it, but people say to me all the time, like, I don't even know who this person is. They're talking about their soon-to-be ex-spouse who they've had children with, they've been so many miles with, and they go, I don't even know who this person is anymore. And, and the answer is that they're, they're still the person they ever were. They're just, I don't know if this is their real face that's showing or if this is just you're seeing them clearly now for the first time. Like, this is a person you married and chose to have a bunch of kids with, and now you're going, I don't even know who this person is, but I'm stuck with them. And divorce is, you know, at best, a knife fight in a closet. I mean, you're just, if you just start stabbing wildly, you're going to you hurt yourself, hurt everybody. Your kids are in the closet, too, with you. Like, it's in the dark. Like, you just, if you, if you, if you handle it, the, I always tell people, I'm a gun. You know, and a gun in the hands of a person who wants to do something good can be a very good thing. It can protect. But in the hands of a nefarious, awful, chaotic person who wants to do bad things, you can do terrible things with a gun. So that's what lawyers are. We're a gun, you know. And, and you're the one who's trying to convince everybody, all right, you can keep your gun. If it makes you feel safe, keep the gun. But just holster it for a minute. And let's just figure out what we're doing here. Let's figure out the rules. Let's figure out what we're fighting about. And let's see where the path to peace might be found. So I, I, I don't know, man. I, I, I mean, th th this is very big stuff. This idea of, of, uh, of the bigger narrative or the like meta narrative of who a person is or who they aspire I, to be and how history plays into that. I think, history, I think it's very, very important. I saw something in your book that you didn't really address, but you, you wrote in your book, which is, by the way, a great book. And I really, Thank really, you. I really, really, really recommend people just to read it. Forget about if they're involved in divorce because everybody knows somebody who's going through divorce and it's like one of the most, for some odd yeah. reason, entertaining topics. Yeah. Um, you write that you believe that the manifestation of conflict in divorce is because of the idea that destiny exists. You realize you wrote that? Yeah. I mean, I wrote and, then, and, then you, and then you just like glossed over it. You wrote, there are two reasons why conflict is terrible, either because people believe in destiny or people believe in 50-50, and then you discuss the 50-50. Yeah. You don't discuss the destiny part. Yeah. For people who read it, what are you, what are you, what are you trying to... Well, I, I think people have a vision of what their life is going to be, and that vision very rarely involves conflict. Like they have in their mind this sort of manifest destiny, this will, this, this, this is what my life is supposed to look the like. The spirit of who they and are. And it's not really based on anything. It's an imagining, you know? It's an imagining of what their ideal life would look like. And, and, and then when the reality of life, like it's interesting because when you're talking about like this meta narrative, like, like, all right, so Moses is this ideal, right? Like, you know, Moses is this wise, resilient creature, right? This was, a, but Moses was also just a dude. He was just a guy, right? He was just a person. Like, and no he, comment, by but, the way, no comment. But a, but a person, no, but, but yeah, the reality is, is he was, but at, on some level, he ate, he slept, he, you know, like he, his feet got dirty. Like he, he was a, a, a being, you know? And so to me, when we take these heroes and ideals and we just talk about the parts of them as we tend to do in fiction or in, in religious scripture, we talk about sort of the ideal manifestation of who this person was. Because it's very easy to put a halo on people that aren't here anymore. You know, like I... You know, when I think back on my mother who passed away six years ago, like I, I remember the most idealized version of her. I don't really think about the fact that, you know, like, I, like all the little things about her that were just very basic and human. But we live in a human world. Like we're human. We're, we're, we're eating and sleeping and cranky sometimes and tired sometimes. And, and so like Moses got tired sometimes, you know, and, 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 and I've, I've always thought to myself, like, what would it be like if we were more human in the way we looked at these ideal characters? Because if these aren't people that we're grappling with the same stuff we're grappling with, I don't know how much they have to give to us. Like, I don't know a Buddhist monk on a mountaintop can relate that much. Like, one of the things is, uh, when I was growing up and in Catholic school, 
you know, one of the fundamental differences between, you know, Catholicism and Judaism is you're married. Like, you can give people advice about their marriage because you're a married man, and you're giving them both ancient wisdom and, 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 and you know, scriptural basis for, and philosophical basis, but you're also drawing on your own experience as the son of a mother and a father who were married to each other and as a man who's married himself. When I would talk to a priest who's never been married, who's never been, you know, and he's giving me advice about marriage, I, I kind of can't help but look at him and go like, you don't have no idea. You've never been in that. You don't, you've never been in that relationship. You've never been in the kind of conflict that two people who are married to each other experience with each other. You've never had the stakes that come with that, the feeling of like, oh man, like this is my spouse. I gotta, I gotta figure out a way to get through this conflict in a way that doesn't burn this person because I'm deeply invested in this person. And this person's deeply invested in our children and we have a lot at stake. So when you talk about this idealized, you know, like we have something to learn from the, from the you know, from Captain Hook, and, and I'm trying to bring everybody back to Steve Hook. I'm trying to bring everybody back to... Because I know in court, when I'm trying to make the other side, I'm trying to paint them in these broad strokes and make them look like that. I'm trying to create villains and heroes. But in reality, it's just people, you know? And I feel like you're much more sitting down with the people as they are. I, I'm, I'm trying to figure out how I disagree. <laughs> how, what, like... You know, I think big, you do disagree. I, there is a big saying. There's a very, very big saying. Um, for the, you know, let, let's 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 talk about this idea. Most religions is the vow that couples make by their marriage, which is until death do we part. Is that part of the marriage, or is that an addition to the marriage? Like, is that the definition of marriage? Until death do we part, or no? I have to add that to the clause of marriage. Like, let's get married, and marriage means whenever we want to end it. Let's add to that a vow. In front of the public, until death do we part. How do you understand? Because we don't. Well, I've always said I tell my clients all the time that all marriages end. They all end. They end in death or divorce, but they all end. That's it. Like there, I've, there's no marriage that's ever lived forever. It doesn't work that way. Like you can, you know, philosophically. So until or, until death do we part. Like right. what? What's that idea? Is that? Am I adding on to the word? Like if I just say, "Hey, let's get married," doesn't that mean until death do we part? Or why it do I have to add that? So, so what definition. is the definition then of marriage? It's a bond. Well, uh, my definition yeah. of marriage. My definition of marriage, it's a legal contract made with the state that registers your relationship as being a particular type of relationship, period. That's it. Okay. Marriage is a legal contract. It's like getting married is like going to the DMV and now, registering now, your now car. Before, You're so let, registering your relationship the same way you registered your car and with the same agency. You're going to the state of New York and saying, I would like your seal of approval. That, that's, to me as a lawyer, that's what marriage fundamentally is. I, I don't believe that two people who are bonded to each other and have said out of 7.3 billion people in the world, you're the one I want to walk this road with. If they spiritually agree, like, hey, this is what we're doing. We're going to be together in this. That's a bond. That's a commitment. But it's not a marriage. So, so what is that commitment? Forget about let's take let's take okay. out right now for take the argument. The let's take out let's take out God and let's take out religion. Okay. What is that commitment? A couple meets each other and they say, "Look, we're committed to stay together." What is in in, in a sentence in two sentences? What are they telling each other? We're committed to stay together. I think they're telling each other different things. I don't think they ever have that conversation. You no, know, in my book, there's a chapter called "What Is the Problem to Which Marriage Is a Solution," and I talk about the fact that how many people ever ask themselves the question, "Why am I getting married?" You get married because you're expected to get married. Uh, let's give, it, it, there's no plainer example. If I'm with a woman and I've been dating her for five years and I say to anyone, oh, we're getting married. People go, oh, mazel tov, that's so great. You're getting married. Of course you're getting married. If I'm with that same woman and I say to someone, we're so happy, we love being together, we live together, we're building a life together, but we've decided we're not gonna get married. People go, oh man wrong with that relationship why aren't they he's not going to get married he must be afraid of commitment or there must be a problem in the relationship i personally don't understand that because i think the reality is is two people marriage is some people get married and go hey this is a spiritual bond that we're agreeing to and whether we're happy or not we're just going to do this thing some people look at marriage as hey you're going to complete me I'm incomplete and you're going to complete me. Some people, marriage is, hey, this is something my parents expect me to do. Some people say, 
I have to get married because I want to have kids. And if I ha want to have kids and I have to get married to have kids, then that's what I'm going to do. Some people say, you know, I want to get married because I want to legitimize the children that we already have together. I mean, I think, I don't know how many people who get married actually sit down and go, why are we getting married? And so to me, the answer to your question is, what do I think? I give you my answer for me as a human being, but that's not an answer to the general question of why should someone or why do people get married? I think that's like saying, why do people go to the movies? I, some people go to the movies because they don't know where else to put themselves. Some people because it's raining outside. Some people because they're bored in their lives and they want to be entertained. Some people go because they're film critics and they get paid to go. Like why people get married, I think that comes, why their marriages are successful and unsuccessful sometimes comes down to why did they do this thing? What were they looking for when they did it? And by the way, I don't think most people have that conversation before they get married, period. That's why I was interested in asking you, do you ever sit down no, so with I'm, couples who I'm are getting married out. and say to them, why are you getting married? So, I, 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 like I said, I never ever do that. And I'm, I'm trying to articulate maybe, maybe why. Let's go to the movie example. Everyone goes to the movies. How many people commit you know, in six months, there's this movie. We're committing to go to the movie together. Make sure, put it in your schedule. I want to commit now in six months because it's a very expensive film and the seats are being sold sure. out and I want to go with you. I want to commit. Why do people commit to that? Like, what's the point of the commitment? Let's just go to the yeah, movie yeah. when it's available. Okay. So I think it's that, that there's something in that movie that they think is going to have value to them. So they go, wow, this is going to be funny or this is going to be something that I know you... You know, it, like if you're being benevolent, you say, look, I know you're going to enjoy this movie. Like it, it has an actor you like or it has a storyline that's something that's fascinating to you. So that for me would be the reason why someone in advance, they'd say the, the, the person you are is going to enjoy or learn from or benefit from this experience. You're giving me a hard time to try to try to get my answer. <laughs> I, I know, I know. One, one second. Why would you see? Let's 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 make it like this. Let's say this kid is making a movie for his parents. He's going to him. He's making a school play, but he doesn't want to. He you find that he doesn't want to invite his parents. You're you're you know yeah. what you know. I'm going to make this a great divorce example. Right. You have dad and mom, and this is their fight. You're representing for argument's sake the dad, and the fight is that the kid has a play coming up, and he only wants he only wants one of his parents to be there because when both of his parents are by their play things turn very, very chaotic, very, very fast. Okay. And this kid doesn't want to deal with it. This is a fairly common example. Fairly, it's in six months this happens now. happens a lot. What, they want a commitment now. They want to come to an agreement in court by the lawyers through mediation, a commitment to be able to prevent whatever this child is afraid will manifest in a terrible, terrible way by the play. What's the point of that commitment? Why are you committing? You're committing that in six months when we're going to be at the play, that things are going to be good. Why do you need to commit that? Because we're scared they're not going to be good because they have a huge right. possibility of not right. being good. Right. And when I'm scared something's not going to be good, I need to commit that you're going to make sure it's good. Okay. I think the definition of marriage by the majority of the world, and I don't think this is a, a, an old ancient perspective. I think this is a relatively new perspective, is that in order for me to get married to you, I need to share with you my deepest, deepest, deepest monster that's inside of me in order for this marriage to work. I can't do that till you don't commit that you're going to run out of the room. I can't be married until I don't have some type of commitment that you agree that this is our destiny together no matter what. Now, it could be a fake destiny, it could be a religious destiny, it could be a fantasy destiny. Like, hey, I know you well enough that I want to create this, fa this, this fake destiny. It's good enough. You know, if you would go ask Nietzsche what his definition of marriage, dating and marriage is, it will be like, date, show the best of you, hide the worst of you, trick the other person. When, they, when you both see the best of each other and you're like, hey, let's get married, let's commit to the best of each other, then you won't be scared to share the terrible stuff. You'll work on that and you'll come back to that original relationship of only knowing, only knowing the best between each other. But it's, I, I mean, I have to tell you, like you're saying that out loud. I, I can't disagree with you. I, 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 I totally understand. Oh, I disagree with this. Yeah, I mean, really? okay, so I understand that concept. And I think that's why marriages are failing at, a, at above a 56% rate right now. Because I think what's happened is we live in an increasingly performative culture thanks to social media. So we figure out who it is we want to tell the world we are. And then we show them pictures, tweets, posts that support that that evidence of who, look, this is who I want to be. 
I want to be this idealized version of myself. I want to, I mean, again, it's not necessarily lying. It's like makeup. Is makeup lying? When a woman puts on makeup, is she lying? No, she's accentuating the best, minimizing the worst, right? Like, I don't think that stockings are lying. I don't think Spanx is lying. I think it's just, you know, you're trying to maximize the best and minimize the worst. You're trying, why do we have lights on us right now? You know, because you want people to be able to see the best of you and maybe not see you in a less favorable light. But here's the problem. If I'm selling you on, I mean, it sounds like what you're saying to me is, okay, so marriage is this idea for many people of I'm going to sell you, I'm going to show you the best parts of me and get you to commit. And then once you've committed, then you're going to inevitably see the real me. You're going to inevitably see the That's the, the real only me. way I'm going to be comfortable sharing the real me without you running out of the room within 30 seconds because the real me is probably very, very scary. Again, this is all with Nietzsche's belief and right. his, that every single person has inside but of them. How this. do you do it any other way, though? I mean, how do you on the how do you say to somebody, look, here's the because I get what you're saying. I mean, look, I, in a perfect world, I'm going to say to my romantic partner, here's the ugliest, worst part of me. Here's the selfish, angry, scared, hurt, lonely, miserable. Here's the monster that lives inside of me. Can you love that? Because if you can love that in me and I can love that in you, then then we're going to be okay. Like, we're going to be okay because it's, it's so easy to love the best parts of someone. It's so easy to love the parts of them that are fun and sexual or all those other things. Like, it's so easy to, to love those parts that we sell to people, right? Like, every movie's good in the previews. It's the best two minutes of the movie, basically. It's all the most exciting parts of the movie, like, lined up at once. I always tell people, like, when you're engaged, it's the previews. It's the previews. So if you're fighting in the previews, the movie's not going to be as good as the previews. The movie's going to have some boring parts. The movie's going to have some parts that you go, oh, I don't really like where this went. So is that an irretractable conflict? Because if, 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 if I, I, and I'm, I'm interested to hear your thought on this, because if the only way to get someone to marry us is to show, us, show them our best face and then hope they stick around when the monster shows up, then that's one set of problems. The other set of problems is, you're not going to convince someone to marry you if you show them the monster first because they're not going to be that interested. They're going to go, well, I don't know, this guy's got all kinds of issues. So the question is, like, when marriage was, okay, here's the best parts of me. Oh, we're married now? Great, you're stuck now. You can't leave or God's going to be mad. Or you're not allowed to legally. You're not allowed to leave me. You have to. So or, now or I can show you Or we promised to each other. Right. We have or a verbal got, commitment. Or we've got kids. We made vows. Or we've got kids. Or we've got kids. We've got kids. I've got kids with this person who just showed up with the monster and never told me the monster existed before. So, like, again, I mean, don't look now, but I think, like, it sounds like an argument against marriage as, as why oh, marriage so Nietzsche, doesn't work. And that's why, that's why I started in the beginning with Nietzsche's quote, the second someone's attracted to you, you should be disenchanted from them because you should know you have fooled them. Nietzsche was trying to bring out this idea that every marriage will be a period that somebody's fooling somebody else and they should be okay with that because you will not share your monster until you're okay that the other person's not going to run away. I don't think that's the Jewish perspective and you see that for how um, how Judaism allows and invented the idea, how Moses invented the idea of divorce. So you see that's, that's, that's not like that. But there is this idea that the monster that you share before you're married is a false monster. It's a monster that it's part of the fantasy. It's part of the destiny. Like, this is my monster. I have... I eat a little bit a lot, you know, or I don't exercise the way I'm supposed to. All those fa false monsters because mm. we have to act human. Right, like self-effacing, yeah, like, but it's almost charming. Exactly. Like, oh, yeah. one thing you're going to have to learn how to get along with me is that I have this issue that I sometimes I'm just such a good husband. Yeah, you know? yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> no, no, but I think people have those. Like, I, I'll admit as a man, mine is, well, I work too much. I work all the time. You know, I'm, I'm work, work is really my number one priority and you're always going to be competing with work. So that's like... It's kind of like a backhanded, like it's it's really a way to like polish me up exactly. without. But like, well, here's my false monster, my false, exactly, my, my false, false monster. compelling monster. And Nietzsche is a, you I just work too much, by the way, which the translation is. But I probably have a lot of exactly. Monsters. So that, know, those are so, the fake yeah, monsters. Yeah. But there are those who believed that you will never share your monster before you're married, and it's a waste of time because it just, be, just will be fake, fake, fake monsters. And those are the people who decided not even to date before they got married, like. It's just a fake. Like, why should I, I start fake expectations? Find out about me. Find out if you could create this destiny, this fantasy, this image of how you want life, this spirit of how you think us two together will live. Think if you could create in your mind how it's going to be amazing. 
Then I'll commit. Imagine it to be. Imagine, create it, write this fake destiny. I mean, that's what dating is. Like I look at a person, find what's best inside of them and create that that's who they are. I create this full spirit of who they are because right. I don't add the monster and I don't become friends with the monster that's, 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 that's really there and that didn't manifest yet. But what I think is very, very, very cool about about uh, this 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 monster that comes out where where people aren't are like too nervous like do I even know who this person is and I read philosophers that discuss this monster and this is the words they use and that's why I'm a really really big fan of this idea of destiny the philosophers I would say more the mystics in like the late 1700s and more like the Hasidim they use these words you being you is God being God it's a very, very profound statement. It came from that the philosophers in like the 1100s and 1200s said things like, to know God is to be God. And they were criticizing people who said, well, I don't know if God exists and I need to know God and where is he and he should prove. And their answer was like, to know someone is to be someone, to know God is to be God. And the mystics understood that, okay, to know God is to be God, but you being you is God being God. So your, your existence is the manifestation of God's will or God's vision or god's creation or purpose wow and therefore the idea of destiny or predetermined destiny is like i have a purpose i have this spirit i gotta fill out like they asked me to be captain hook in this world if i'm gonna act like steve yeah. hook we're not gonna accomplish this magnificent picture of this fantasy that we created of what the movie's supposed to look like and if you want to act like something different you're not accomplishing the person who wrote the movie you not being captain hook is not allowing the writer to be the writer and that's the most amazing thing with conflict. Like, who am I? Is this really who I am? Am I manifesting who I'm supposed to be? And then I took someone else in my life and I said, hey, let's create this vision of destiny together and see if we're going to keep it. And then that falls apart. I, I, I'm interested in that, that phrase you just said, am I manifesting who I'm supposed to be? Because how do you manifest something that you're not supposed to be? I mean, I'm, I'm, my, John Lennon pops into my mind from All You Need Is Love, you know, that... that there's nothing, there's nothing you can do that can't be done. There's no place you could be that isn't where you were meant to be. I mean, I, I, I don't, I think we've really gotten away in this culture from the idea of God's plan. Like the idea, I mean, we've gotten away from the concept of God, but we've definitely gotten away from the concept of that there is a destiny, that there is a plan. But, but if there is a destiny, how can we be out of sync with our destiny if it's our destiny? If, if my destiny, it's my destiny, then my destiny is to be out of sync with my destiny, which means I'm in sync with my destiny. Or you're always in internal conflict. Well, I, I haven't met anybody who isn't always. In yeah, I mean, think about it. What is internal conflict? That I have this predetermined destiny of who I am because there's some hierarchy that's telling me who I'm supposed to be, whatever that is, if that's culture, if that's society. It's like the movie Pinocchio. Pinocchio was created by the father, right? That's, that's, that's the idea. He has Jiminy Cricket, JC, which is the bug in our life that the Christians believe that's going to bug you always, right? Because right. JC is JC. And the idea is that he doesn't want to be held by the puppeteer, by his father, by God. And he wants Pleasure Island, right? Like I have he wants, never thought of Pinocchio on this meta, meta level. Before. Oh, you got to read the way that it's written in the book. I actually I've never just thought it. of it on this level. Yesterday I went because... I feel like this entire conversation, I should be on mushrooms. <laughs> and I should be just like... Because this would be mind... I'm, 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 I'm already sort of mind blown, right? This is a real weird way to start a Monday. Like, yeah, just to but, listen to, to... Because I did never thought of Pinocchio as the Christ metaphor. Oh, you didn't know that Jiminy Cricket was that? With no, JC? I had no idea. I had in, no the, idea. in the South, they that's how they They don't teach you this in Catholic school. Wait, so yeah. in the South, that's how... Does this come up a lot in, uh, in, in, in yeshiva? Yeah, of course. Jeez. What do you think? Oh. <laughs> I really missed out. At a whole out. different level because we criticize stuff. Like, you have to understand the yeshiva system. The yeshiva system is a critical system. It's a system of, is this your destiny or not? How do we know? Because there's no, no prophet to tell us, like, what the future is supposed to be. But every religion has this idea, this subconscious that sits on your shoulder that bugs you, right. which is Jiminy Cricket. And the South, they, when because they, they didn't want to say what they believed is their Lord's name in vain. Sure. So they like, hey, Jiminy Cricket. That was the word that was used yeah. in the South. And it was like, it was the bug that like really haunts you at night and tells you what your destiny is supposed to be. But you're like, you know what, enough. I don't want to have any puppeteer in my life. But what you get to realize is that when they cut those strings attached, there's different strings that control you. And that's Pleasure Island. Pleasure Island controls you. It creates a new destiny. You're out of control. When you're an addict, you're out of control. It's not like, oh, I'm free. 
You have a new destiny that you painted. And like, are you going to fulfill that alcoholic prediction of how, how right. what's destined for such a person like you right yeah, now? Yeah, you're trading one set of strings for another. And it's a big mistake that I think I think society believes that you could just cut off your strings and not have a new one. Like we're all governed by a hierarchy. That was Jung's idea. I don't know if yeah. you know. Carl Jung's idea is that we're governed by a hierarchy. Yeah. And that hierarchy is our subconscious. Yeah. 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 So our subconscious is our destiny. Whatever you believe is your predetermined destiny. When you get married, the couple is saying like, let's create our own destiny. We don't know what it is, but like maybe we'll fulfill it. And then you want to say like, but let's talk before the wedding and let's discuss what that destiny is. Like, but you don't know. You don't know what trials are going to come your way. Yeah. What trumps? Are you going to make money? You're not. You're going to have healthy children. There are so many unanswered questions. Are you going to have kids? Nobody knows these stuff. You're making a very solid argument, by the way, for arranged marriage. I don't know if you oh, realize yeah, that. Uh, that I'm, yeah, but not not the way that you're that the public is going to think you're referring to. The no, no. But marriage. I mean it from the but point yeah. of view. I mean it from the point of view of your your what you're what you're saying is look you you can't know exactly who you are. At any like who you'll be right who you're going to manifest to become you can't know who this other person is going to manifest to become but you're committing to working on each other's like on building yourselves and each other's destiny together and trying to manifest in that journey or committing to this that depends which religion you're part of so if you're getting married and in the jewish ceremony you're saying these words this marriage should be within the custom of moses and israel you're creating this hierarchy called Moses and the, and the nation of Israel, and you say that they set they set a value called marriage, and that means something. And I'm nullifying myself to their understanding. Or if you're a Christian, you're accepting the, the cross, you're ex- whatever that whatever that means, the Father and the Son that goes through the Holy Spirit, and you're accepting that in your life, or whatever you're accepting is that predetermined destiny. And one of the things I and I'm, I, this is a whole chapter in my book that that, that I hope to come out within a year. Um, there's a huge, a huge, something fascinating when Maimonides criticizes people who talk about destiny. Maimonides has a whole chapter where he talks about the people who believe they don't have free choice because everything's predestined. And he says, these are the words. He says, don't allow this thought process to go through your mind what the nations of the world say and what the foolish Jews say that everything is predestined and that you don't have choice to do something different than your destiny. Everyone has free choice. And I found it fascinating that he criticizes one of the only places, and it could be, really one of the only places that Maimonides, when he criticizes a thought process, he differentiates Jewish people and non-Jewish people by two different criticisms. I think Jewish people, he calls them um, gullible, and non-Jewish people, he calls them fools. Non-Jewish people who believe that destiny governs them are fools, and Jewish people who believe destiny governs them are gullible. Two negative characteristic traits, but he seems to have different expectations because what are your hierarchies of predestiny that you're making up in your head? And then you're going to need to live with that and that but you're so 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 to tie it back to pinocchio so it's you're going to be governed by a set of strings under all circumstances and the question is is picking your set of strings yeah that by the way don't that i shouldn't plagiarize like that's a chapter from jordan peterson's book oh is it okay. yeah the pinocchio the pinocchio metaphor i've no. i've studied which one is new one or is old um i think it's in 12 rules to life or a map of meetings yeah. But, I mean, I've actually heard him discuss it live. I was by a few yeah, events. Yeah, I mean, he's very, I, I mean, look, I think he's, he's, he's like the modern Joseph Campbell, who is the modern Carl Jung. I mean, they're all talking about these archetypes, the collective unconscious, the monomyth, the idea of the hero's journey. I mean, this is like, this is, this is ancient wisdom I, I'm on board with. And it's, it's basically the idea of what is your destiny and do you live it out? Because you being you is your destiny being your destiny, which is the idea of God. God is destiny by most people. It is what is predetermined in your life and how you're supposed to act to fit what you want in life. God is The idea of God is destiny. And you being you is your destiny being your destiny. You being you is God being God. And the conflict, the inner conflict people have is like, am I being myself? And that's an inner conflict. And you can only resolve that through dialogue with yourself, which you have to then try with other people, including your spouse. I mean, if you want to know if you could have inner conflict conversation with yourself, see if you're successful with somebody else first. And if you can't have a successful, peaceful outcome of a conversation of inner conflict or external conflict with somebody else, forget about having a conversation of internal conflict with yourself. And that's what life's about. Are you being you? And I think that's why divorce is so fascinating. You told me this. You told me a while back there, the reason why divorce is so entertaining by everybody yeah. is because it's something that everyone didn't believe was going to happen. Well, yeah, I think, I think we live in a culture where 
again, because we're so performative, largely because of social media, but even before social media, it was always about, well, what are the neighbors going to think? You know, how do we present ourselves the right way? How do we tell the story to the world of who we are in a way that paints us in a flattering light and makes us a hero of the story as opposed to a villain? So I, I think one of the things that always fascinated me about divorce is you can't pretend you meant to get divorced. You, you can't fit it into your perfect narrative. People spend so much, you get fired from your job, you go, well, I never really liked that job anyway, I was gonna quit, you know, it was never the right job for me. Or whatever else happens in your life, you, you, most of the time you can say, like, we, we need that in life. I mean, to feel like we have some sense of control. I mean, I, 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 you know, I had a friend recently tell me that their, their father had lung cancer, you know, it's a terrible thing. And, and I would never say, was he a smoker? You know, but the first thing I thought was, oh, was he a smoker? I mean, I hope he was a smoker. Because I, what was I really saying other than, oh my God, like can terrible things like that just happen for no reason? Like if this guy had to do something that made that happen to him, because I have a father and I want my father to not die of lung cancer, so my father doesn't smoke. So maybe his father smokes and that's, that won't happen to my dad then. And it's a way to like have control over a universe that feels like we have no control over. So I, I think in divorce, it's a humbling thing and a terrifying thing for people because you can't pretend you meant this to happen. You signed up. You said, I'm going to be with you forever. I'm going to love you forever. You're going to love me forever. And then you've decided, yeah, we're not going to do that. And so you have to humble yourself and go, okay, now what? What do I build now? You know, and it's really like that, that Basho quote, you know, like since the barn roof burned, I can see the moon. Like there's a feeling of like, okay, in the tragedy of this, there's an opportunity for rebirth. There's an opportunity for growth. You know, I was a psych major as an undergrad and I was very much about becoming a therapist. It's what I wanted to do. And then I realized that I would actually have more of a skill set for, and I would probably enjoy more working in divorce law. If I wasn't a divorce lawyer, I would not be a lawyer. It's the only area of law that ever intrigued me, and ever interested me, because of this fundamental thing, that, that it's this opportunity for growth, whether it's a person has decided, I'm going to blow up my life and get divorced. I'm going to start a divorce, even though, you know, this other person doesn't want it. It's going to be tumultuous for my children in some fashion, I'm going to do this because I think there's something better. I have faith that there's something better waiting for me on the other end of this. Or more often, somebody just blew my life up. My husband came home and said, I'm out. I'm gone. I'm in love with my secretary. I'm in love with my dental hygienist, whatever it might be. And, and now your whole life has to change where you live, when you see your kids, you know, your day to day, everything, who your definition of who you are. You know, I'm a wife, I'm a mother, I'm a, I'm a husband, I'm a father that blows up in an instant. And this person has to start from scratch. And then the question is, is who am I? If I'm not a wife, if I'm not a husband, who am I in this, this void? Am I just this formless thing spinning in the void? Or am I still me? Is there still some fundamental thing that I am of value? Is there some story still worth telling or has my story just been ruined? And the people that I think I, who do well in divorce are people who say, yeah, I didn't expect this. I didn't expect this. This wasn't the path I chose at the time I chose to get married. This wasn't what I thought it was going to be. But there's still a story. There's still something of value. And I'm going to build something beautiful out of my life. And I think my job as a divorce lawyer is to try to get people the things they need, the tools they need to build that life. And that's where I try very hard when I meet with clients from the beginning to get them thinking about their post-divorce life. Because if you're just thinking about the conflict and you're just thinking about the fighting, you're just thinking about the things the person did, the other side did wrong in the marriage and the things you did right in the marriage, you're not thinking about what's coming next. And, what, and, and, and that's what we have to start working on and building. And yes, those, those things you did right and the things the other person did wrong, that's, that's how we're going to get you the things that you need to build this next chapter of your life. But if you have no sense of what that's going to be, you know, then, then you have nothing. Yeah. Why is divorce so interesting? It's interesting because here's the thing. Like, you know, when I wrote a book, people said, well, you know, who's going to want to read books about divorces except the people that are getting divorces, which, by the way, is 56% of married people. So that's still a big market. But the truth is, like, why are we so interested in divorce? Why do we watch divorce? And I think it's because conflict is interesting. 
It's the most interesting stuff. Like, you don't remember from the Oscars this year, you know, oh, wasn't that a lovely speech that that person gave where they thanked their mother? Like, that's not a memorable moment. Chris Rock getting smacked by Will Smith. That is the moment everyone's going to remember from this Oscars period. Because conflict is more interesting. You know, my mentor in graduate school, Neil Postman, wrote a book called Amusing Ourselves to Death. And, and in that book, he talked about, and he, it was before the internet, but he talked about the fact that, that like Marshall McLuhan has said, that, that you know, television likes conflict because war is more interesting than peace. Like showing you a peaceful room is boring. You're saying a presidential mediation is not going to happen sometime soon. I don't think so. I don't think so. But that so. would be cool. It would be cool, would yeah. Be cool and listen, it would be a more perfect union, I'll say yeah. that. But the truth is, is it, it's not because... We like conflict. It's fascinating. Conflict is more interesting than peace. But why? Because it's active. Because it's, it's um, I think it's visually compelling. You know, people speaking in a peaceful conversation is like, think about the Lincoln-Douglas debates. You know, Lincoln had an hour and a half to talk, and then Douglas had an hour and a half to talk, and then they each had an hour to rebut the, yeah, how many people had sit through that? Come on. Now it's, um, how would you as president resolve the conflict in Israel and Palestine? You have 30 seconds. Thir the only rational answer to that is 30 seconds is a wholly inadequate amount of time to answer that question. That is a conflict that has existed for an extended period of time and involves, a, it's a multivariate equation. And to even suggest that in 30 seconds I could answer that question is the silliest thing ever. And I probably, by the way, just went over 30 seconds just explaining why you can't take 30 seconds to do that. So conflict is... It's, it's an encapsulation of the human experience. It's love, it's pain, it's, uh, it's fear, it's all of those things. I mean, that moment where Chris Rock got smacked, there was fear, there was boldness, there was, you know, there, there was all of the exciting, adre you know, adrenal gland stimulating aspects of, of life were all on display at once. Like, I don't know how you felt when you saw that, but I felt... Like the whole array of you, I felt alive, man. I was watching it and I was like, oh my God, that's scary and sad and exciting and fascinating. And I also kind of want to look away because it's embarrassing. I'm embarrassed for Will Smith. I'm embarrassed for Chris Rock that he's got smacked by a grown man. Like I, I, you're watching it and you're going, God, that's just so much more compelling. I mean, what if Chris Rock had just made a crappy joke about, you know, a movie from the 90s nobody saw and Will Smith went, hoo, hoo, and that was it, and everybody moved on. It would have been much more boring. But here we are talking about it weeks later because of the conflict. Because the conflict was the most interesting thing about it. I mean, it's why reality TV shows, the real housewives of fill in the blank. It was always like, you know, it started as, oh, here's these weird people with weird lives who have a lot of cosmetic surgery and a lot of money. And then it, they realized very quickly, like, oh, it's not interesting. We got to set up conflicts. We got to set up, like, opportunities for these people to get in fights with each other because the fights is all anybody wants to see. You know, that's why I've always said, like, sports don't make a lot of sense to me. You know, I, was, I grew up in combat sports. I was a fighter. That's why my nose looks like this. And I always was like, well, football, it's like, dude, just beat the crap out of each other. That's all anybody wants to see. Don't get a ball involved. Don't, put, don't, get, don't get all that stuff. Don't get, a, you know, don't get bats involved. Don't get soccer balls involved. Like, just, we want gladiators. We want blood sport. Get in there and just kill each other, and we'll stand there and watch it happen. But why? Like, what? that's that, the under question to that is why is that so interesting to us? And why has it always been so interesting to us from the Roman Colosseum to the Real Housewives of Orange County? Why do we want to watch conflict? It's, I can't answer that. But, I mean, I can't answer that. Well, if you that, can't answer no, it, no, no, I don't no, know I who's going to. I can't answer that. You have that. the wisdom of the sages <laughs> at your disposal. No, I can't answer why, why it would, an answer that I think is universal and that everyone's going to agree, but I can tell you that I just, I just got for, now we're hitting the, the Pesach, the Passover holidays, and one of the things that I suffer in is that I can't read on the internet as much as I would like to read, and that's what I spend most of my awake hours trying to do, reading and so I have to buy books. So every Passover, you know, usually a week before, the Sunday before, which was yesterday, you know, I take my kids to Barnes and Nobles and we buy like 
books for enough Passovers. Like if Moses would take us out for the desert for 40 years, I would have enough books now for 40 years. I can't last. just like come over and be like your Shabbos goy. Like I could just scroll down the things for you. Scroll the next page. Yeah. yeah, listen, we've been we've been friends long enough. I but could do know, that. You know you. how I see that. Because I would put on some stuff, by the way, that I want you to read. I know. I that know you, you know, know, like I would definitely you use this as an yeah, opportunity. Oh, I would have a great time. Yeah. Oh my God. If I get to pick your reading bits here, yeah. I will, I'm telling you right now, I'm going to say this on the record. I will be your Shabbos goy anytime. Because if I I knew that Saturdays I could force you to read whatever I needed you to read. Oh, this is, I would sign up for that job. I'll do it for free. I'll tell you right now. Um, yeah, you should come over Friday. All right, all right, great. I'm up. So, Listen, I love a good chillin'. Yeah, so I, I, bought, I bought my daughter. I decided to bring her to buy her a lot of good books. She's 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 getting older and she loves reading. And 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 I find the material that's coming out nowadays more horrific for kids to read. So I'm trying to bring her back to like old books, you know, like the old Hardy to- Hardy Boy books. Oh, like yeah. What was that perspective? So she read the majority of Hardy Boy books. She loved it. Harry Potter, you know, the classics. Right. And we went then further back and we started getting like Huckleberry Finn and Mark Twain, you know, the classic, the classic Your daughter's going to get canceled, by the way, but yeah. Yeah, ahead. I know. But the classic books. And then we hit the Spanish Inquisition. And there was a great book that I got for her. She's actually going to be reading it over um, Passover that's called Don Y. Aguilar. It's about this family, family called the Aguilar family, which was this, what they call Moranos, which were hidden Jews that had to hide their whole Jewish experience throughout the Spanish Inquisition. It's how they got caught through the bishop, and it's a fascinating book. And I was thinking about, because one of the reasons I, I, I like my children to read is it inspires questions, and when it inspires questions, I hope that it inspires internal conflict, and when it inspires internal conflict... That's where you grow. So I'm thinking in this book. You like, heard it here first. Rabbi Kahan is trying to inspire conflict in his children. Oh, yeah. I just want to put that right out there in case his wife is listening. <laughs> that he is trying right to put your children right into conflict. I'm going to use this in a deposition. Somewhere. Oh, I know you it's are. very yeah, good. Like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and, and one of the scenes that is, that, that's portrayed in that book, which is a fascinating scene, is actually the scene where the Jews are caught being Jewish. And that scene takes place by an event. Um, I forgot. I forgot. Um, wow, it slipped my mind with the bull and the and the, the Spanish event that with the bull chase. Oh, the running the, of the bulls. The running yeah, of the, the bulls. No, not the running of the bulls. Oh. With the bull chase. Oh, a bullfighter. A bullfighter. Bull bull fighter, but fighter, I forgot yeah, the exact yeah, yeah. word that that's mm-hmm. used. Mm-hmm. A, matador. a matador. A matador. A matador. Oh, the matador is the person who fights the bull. So, what was the event called? Forgot the event's name. The event had a name to it. Well, it's called bullfighting, but yes, it's it's. It was tor- an old tor- uh, torreador. No, what is it called? It's, it, it has. It was some yeah. beautiful Latin or yeah, Spanish yeah, yeah, expression yeah. That, that that was actually actually very rich. And in there, the two girls who are Jewish were at the event because the whole community, the king and queen, everyone sure. came there, and they get disgusted by watching everyone celeb, everyone enjoying and creating this individual who's first herding the bull as a celebrity and when he gets killed as the bull as a celebrity. Right. And they're talking about how the bull because finally gets the man on its horns and is 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 running around showing its prize to everybody and everybody's totally. cheering and they're disgusted. I'm usually cheering for the bull. Yeah. And they're disgusted and the bishop points out, how could you be disgusted? That's a Jewish thing to be disgusted. Interesting. And 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 that's where they get exposed and they get scared that they were caught and that's where everything turns south and that's the climax of the story of the Sp- of of the of the Y Aguilar family in the Spanish Inquisition. And I'm I'm anticipating on Chalamod, my daughter, to come over to me and say, "Look, pa, Dad, I'm up to this chapter of the book, and why is there a difference? Like, why are Jews disgusted from from this type of conflict?" And as I've been visualizing or making up that my daughter is going to come ask this question and start starting to become prepared for some type of answer. Internal conflict manifests externally, I believe, in watching other people fight and thinking, would you fight the same way? Totally. That's what conflict's about, and that's what's watching other people. It's your own internal conflict. Like when someone gives an opinion and someone says, I think they're fighting like this and this, I'm like, well, I know what's going on in your marriage right now. <laughs> and you really, and you probably enjoy actually like watching the last seven people who told me that ended up a divorce within the last year. And I think external conflict for people really tells them to rejudge their own life. What they find entertaining, what they don't find entertaining. <laughs> You're like yeah. looking at me now. No, I, I actually, I, 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 it, my look is one of, of, of recognition as I sometimes have when you're talking. And that is that I, I think you're absolutely right. I never thought of it that way, but it's absolutely right. I, I, my own experience of watching shows with a significant other, it, it becomes a way to talk about something that we need to talk about by talking about other people. 
So going like, well, you know, she, I think she feels this way. It's like, well, I mean, maybe he feels this way. Well, <laughs> well, you know, like, I mean, you know, she's just so negative with him all the time. And as well, I mean, he's not exactly positive to her all the time. And meanwhile, it's like, dude, we're talking about us right now. Like this is, we're talking about us, but it feels safe. Because it's okay for me to say, I hate this housewife on the Housewives of Orlando, you know, as opposed to saying, I hate this about you. I hate when you do that. I hate when you say that. Or, you know, I, why don't you understand why he's behaving that way is really a way of saying, why don't you understand why I'm behaving that way? You know, and I, 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 I look, I think the bullfighting is a great example. I mean, bullfighting is an example. We watch violence because there's something in us that craves violence. There's something in us that craves, you know, like, like we understand the desire to do harm. You know, we understand the desire, we understand the fear of having harm done to us. So it's this incredible encapsulation of the human experience. But, but again, like... And that's, and that's why people cry during movies and they laugh. Sure. And, and they're scared if it's a horror movie and they'll inflict that on themselves. Mm -hmm. And people watch their temperament. And that's why, you know, they, they, they want to watch what they're feeling and they want to be relatable very, very fast. They want to create this other reality outside of them. And I do believe there's a huge rich tradition in, in, in the Jewish biblical texts that is that every character and every personality in the world has already been played out in the biblical text. So you could actually discuss every personality, good and not good, and in the best, they have always been criticized, which is fascinating about Judaism. Everyone, even Moses, is criticized once for not doing what he was supposed to do, whatever that means, because he really had clarity. And Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and their wives and Rachel and Leah and, 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 and Sarah and Rebecca, their personalities, they fit those personalities Abraham fit the personality of Abraham perfectly till he ended up being Abraham. And it's a very complicated idea that every it's person... A, it's the second time you've actually said it in this context. And I, I think it's a very interesting thing about how, you know, Moses became the Moses Moses was meant to be, like, because he was the one who could be Moses. And he did it. Yeah, yeah. That's a really... That's a really... There, there's, there's, a hard verse, to there's a verse in Hebrew around. that... that one, there's a verse in Hebrew, one man who was Abraham, who stood up as Abraham and ended up being Abraham. There's that Talmudic text that you have to decipher what that means. It means there were many Abrahams, but one stood up and was Abraham. So, but let's flip that into the concept of marriage. So who is Abraham married to again? Sarah. Sarah, okay. I, knew, I thought it was Sarah. All right, so Sarah, so did, Sa which Sarah was, she's, which, like who did Sarah sign up to marry? Because she didn't sign up to, to I'm going to call him the, alterate, the ultimate iteration of Abraham. Like the, the, the over Abraham, right? Like she didn't sign up for that. She signed up to a dude named Abraham, right? Like she just signed up for this guy. So what does she in that coupling become the Sarah she's supposed to also have been? Or does the Sarah who she's supposed to be, was that always with the archetypal Abraham? Like I, I, I just... Because the question is... Look, I mean, you have that with Abraham and Sarah also. You could ask that question. Abraham's perspective, was, would he be Abraham without marrying Sarah? Well, no, obviously. Right. I mean, but every connection, you know, creates every possible other connection that follows it and excludes all the possibilities of the things that would have happened if that thing didn't happen, right? So every single choice, you know, eradicates other choices and creates new opportunities that wouldn't have existed had you not made that choice. So, so that, that's clear, right? So if we look at like the Venn diagram of our lives, like there's what you did and no longer an option. And that's it, you know? But, but the, the question that we keep coming back to or that you keep coming back to that's interesting to me is, okay, what's at the end of that? Because if you're starting that journey, if you're getting married, for example, like as, as we talk about punctuation marks in people's lives. So you marry this person, you are joining your destiny with theirs, or, they are, or you are fulfilling the destiny of yours that was to be with this person, right? Depending on how you're looking at it. So divorce feels like it's a break in that, but, but perhaps it's not a break in that. Perhaps it is your destiny to divorce. And so what do you do with that? That's the beauty of not knowing your destiny. You see, Jung, Jung believed, and this probably came from Nietzsche, but Jung believed that everyone has a higher Nietzsche's getting a lot of airtime with yeah, us I know. today, by the way. I'll tell you why, and I'll tell you why. Nietzsche's getting a lot of airtime because where the world went 
in the last couple of minutes or weeks or months or years, whenever yeah. people think the world just took this drastic turn and became this radical separation, I've decided then to restudy and reevaluate the 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 era before World War One and World War Two yeah. and how people were communicating then and how similar it is to now. And that was Nietzsche's period. Nietzsche I, have, wrote, I haven't quoted Nietzsche this much since like my sophomore year of college. Because yeah. like everybody, you know, like for when you're a recovering Catholic like I am, you know, when you're like a long haired sophomore in college, you know, sitting on a rock outside the student center smoking a cigarette, you definitely want to be holding like Zarsuthstra <laughs> or the Antichrist so that people would walk up to you and be like, oh, what are you reading? Oh, Beyond Good and Evil. You know, like you want to be, you know, someone who's, who's, who's uh, uh, deep enough to understand Nietzsche. But then, you know, I think a lot of people sort of get past, you know, because there's so much valid criticism of Nietzsche, just like, you know, how it leads to like an Ayn Rand kind of yeah. self-determination, you know, like, uh, uh, like an incredibly uh, narcissistic view of the universe and, and an incredible. That's what Nietzsche created. Yeah. Nietzsche, when he debunked philosophy and he created that psychology is going to be this new understanding, I think he created narcissism to a very high level. Yeah, absolutely. Don't, I shouldn't be quoted no, on that. No, but that's why the, Nietzsche is constantly quoted by narcissists. I mean, yeah. you know, he's, a, he's like, that's their greatest he's, test. We, I like, I like, you know, I, I, I think Nietzsche is fun to quote because he, he doesn't really say enough and you can make up whatever you want in Nietzsche, in his words. And you could really, really decipher what he meant. And it's very, very similar to Jewish work. You see, the old... It's very funny that you're saying Nietzsche, who was you know, staunchly anti-religious and constantly criticizing religion as something for the ill-constituted and weak. That, you know, I, I never imagined I'd be listening to Nietzsche quotes from a rabbi. Oh, a, yeah. 100%. When you're talking about Nietzsche's... my manifestation of my destiny, I never imagined that one. And I'm an imaginative <laughs> guy. No, I believe the reason why I like quoting Nietzsche is I believe his criticisms are very, very valuable and he doesn't give up answers. Mm -hmm. So I like using him when I have, when I, when I talk with people who, who, that Nietzsche would be much more relatable as a source sure. than one of my sources. Sure. Right? Well, Nietzsche, Hebrew, Nietzsche for a secular worldview it's, Nietzsche it's a relatable is, source. Yeah, 100%. So Nietzsche asked the questions that the philosophers in his era asked and the Jewish philosophers, but he leaves no answers to those questions. So that's where I could come in. I could use him as a platform to ask the question and say, hey, I'm forced to bring in my Jewish theology into the right. door because nobody else asks those questions in any other religion and gives right. an answer. Right. And I'm, I'm going to try to share those answers of what, of what, like what Nietzsche's criticisms right. were, what his conflicts were and, what is the answer? Right. Like, what, what is it? But well, and because fundamentally, you know, you and I have a lot of conversations and they're long and they go all over the place. But where we ultimately land in our disagreement is like a very simple thing because we get back to these first principles and your answer is, because God, that's why. And my answer is, yeah, but because maybe there's not God. So what does that even mean? So we kind of get back to this fundamental principle where we're at, I don't want to say impasse, but, but we're trying to resolve a secular worldview, a, a purely secular worldview with a divinely inspired or a divinely informed worldview. And I think that that is a fundamental challenge in our society right now. Yeah, and, and the religious narrative, the, whatever religion, I mean, again, Christianity, Islam, whatever religion a person has, I, I have a friend who's a Hare Krishna and has been for many years. And, and I remember once, you know, debating with him about his religion. And he said to me, like, we're all in cults. I'm not alone. You're in a cult too, Jim. Like, you're just, you know, we're, we're, you have so much programmed in your head. You have so much that you've accepted as true just because you've been told it's true. And I'm just being candid about the presumptions that are inherent in my logic and the, the, the unprovable, because proof denies faith. You know, faith is, is, is an exercise of, of, of just belief. It's, it's, I'm not suggesting it's antagonistic to logic. I'm not saying it's antagonistic to... But there is a core place we get back to in conflict. Again, this is, this is why in this conversation, you know, the, we, we reach a point in conflict where it's the same kind of fundamental thing. Like I see in all the time in divorces where the person says, well, why should I this, 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 this? And the answer is because we're married. We're married. And that's supposed to mean something. That's supposed to be something that's not so utterly disposable. And there's this fundamental view that we have of marriage that I don't know exists that much in a culture anymore, in a particular I, secular culture. I really, you see, 
To quote one more Nietzsche. I love it. <laughs> to quote one more Nietzsche, but this you're is pandering me. to me because you know I'm German. That's what this yeah, is. Yeah, no, no, I, I knew could it. be that's I what it is, it. like subconsciously. Yeah. No, one of the reasons that I enjoyed Nietzsche is because Nietzsche inspired a great question, which I believed most of the Hasidim, believe it or not, tried to answer during his era. That means I do believe that the Hasidim read a lot of Nietzsche's work because you write, you see their so-called rebuttals and you don't know what they're rebuttaling until you actually see Nietzsche's work. Were they allowed to read that? Was that Yeah, yeah, and I think they really, oh, okay. I think they, the great, I don't know the rules. Exactly. Oh, so the great leaders of, of, of all the Hasidic communities before World War I wrote fascinating books. I'm talking about great, great, great books and every community from Barditchev, he wrote a book, The Holy of the Tribe of, Le, of, of Levite. And each book is like, it takes apart the questions of the world that their era was dealing with. Mm. Usually their questions came from enlightenment movements, right? Mm -hmm. Which is, which is, by the way, which is an, which is an Egyptian idea. And the Egyptian culture of God is that ideas are gods, and ideas compete with each other to take over the human brain. And the idea that's it's like most, a dominance hierarchy. It's, it's of, a dominance hierarchy of, of ideas, ideas that are fighting with each other. Wow. And that that's the Egyptian gods, and 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 that's Osiris and Isis. And yeah. if you study the Egyptian gods and the pharaohs, and it's a very deep concept, which I happen to be discussing now because we're close to the Passover. Um, and is it survival of the fittest idea or survival of the most entertaining idea? So or in, the most comforting idea. The Egyptian culture is very very similar to the Christian culture, which is that the father dies, he can't live without the son. Right, and the son is only going to be manifested through purity, which is a relationship between the father, the grandfather, and the mother, or the father and the mother. Right, right. which is I think it's Osiris has a relationship with Isis that gives birth to Pharaoh, you know, instead of Seth, which is Satan. Right. They have it's very very similar that total manifestation has to happen through a more purity through through malevolence and evil and, right. and disobedience right. and chaos and then and conflict. Then, and you know you know it's a very very similar Disney show to to Egyptian culture is the Lion King. Sure. So the Lion King you have the old king I feel, right. what Simba his name is? That's no Simba that's, no, no Simba's the kid. Simba's the kid. Um Musafa yeah, there's there's the bad uncle. No, the bad that's that's right. Scar, but the, right. the, the 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 father who basically my kids are way older than yours, so I don't, yeah, I'm not as up on my Disney. No, but this is my kids aren't up to that Disney. It's from my childhood. Yeah, but basically the Lion King was that manifestation. If you think about it, this is the Lion King. The Lion King is this old king who has these great ideas that everybody respects, like like Professor Dumbledore and Harry Potter. Right. Like everybody respects, but like we don't know why we need him really. But we know he needs to protect us. Like he's going right. to protect us, from, but we don't know how and. He can't govern anymore because ideas are old and they die. Right. And the only way to manifest dead ideas into society is through tyranny. And that's what it turns out. It turns tyranny. Tyranny is the son of an idea that's dead. If you think of what tyranny, what control is, it's an idea that's dead. And I need to control that idea. That's the definition of control and tyranny. It's like I have this idea and I'm scared that you're not going to understand it fully, or I don't understand it fully because it's somehow dead and it's not so relative, but I know that this is the only way I could govern. I mean, that's that, that who, that's who right. the father is. Right. Right. And so of course, Simba runs away, and which is that he has to live alone and his father has to die and manifest in him that he could take over yeah. through all the pain and give rebirth. And there's one individual, I don't know if you ever watched or you remember, there's one individual who's always in the movie from beginning to end, and that is the bird. I forgot what its yeah. name is in the movie. Um, I, I forgot what the name is, and it's the eye, like on the top of yeah. the Egyptian pyramid yeah, that's, yeah, yeah, that's yeah, higher, yeah. or like on the dollar bill you right, see. Right, 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 it's right. the eye that gets to see everything from beginning to end of the pyramid, understands the top, understands how it manifests, and says, look, it's going to happen again, and ideas are going to die, and they're going to be reborn again, and ideas are going to die, and a new idea is going to be reborn, but through ideas, chaos, chaos is going to look for stability, and you're going to create new stability, and that's the Lion King, and that's the Egyptian culture. Thank you for listening to Argue in Peace. We hope you enjoyed this episode. And if you did, please consider leaving us a review and subscribing on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever it is that you listen or watch. You can also follow us on Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube. Also, feel free to let us know what topics you'd like to see covered in future episodes. Get in touch in the comments or, of course, on our social media. See you next week for a brand new episode of Argue in Peace.